All right, well, I'll start this by encouraging everybody to pray that the rain holds off. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Aaron Gulbertson, and I have the very great privilege of running the Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition. And we are very happy to work with very conservative members of the General Assembly, stalwarts of conservative issues in the Constitution, like Majority Leader Jack Johnson, Majority Leader William Lamberth. And while we don't endorse in uh, individuals in presidential primaries, what we do is endorse truth and endorse freedom. And we believe that Vivek Ramaswamy endorses what we endorse, which is freedom, truth, and the Constitution. We're very, very, very happy that he, along with, I call her the great Candace Owens, has, has decided to shed a national light on a very important issue, which is the release of the manifesto. It is very important, especially when you're talking about an issue that involves public policy. We, we all know of the tragedy that occurred, but we must know the motivations behind it before you ask anybody to make public policy decisions. It must be released at its position of the Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition. And I just want to again thank Vivek Ramaswamy, Vivek and Candace Owens, and of course Aaron Spradlin, who we'll hear from in a minute. So you didn't come here to see me. I appreciate you, sir. Come on up. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us on this important occasion here in Nashville. On March 27th, six innocent Americans, three adults and three children, were shot and killed at the Covenant School just miles from where we are today. I'd like to start this meeting with a moment of silence to pray for the victims of this tragedy. Evelyn Dickhouse, age nine. William Kinney, age nine. Hallie Scruggs, age nine. Mike Hill, age 61. Catherine Kuntz, age 60. Cynthia Peak, age 61. I'd also like to recognize the heroism of the two police officers who took action that day. Officers Rex Engelbert and Michael Colazzo, who did not flinch for a moment, who took down that shooter for saving lives. They are true heroes. We thank those first responders, and on behalf of this community, we thank them as well. Out of respect for the families and the victims, I'm going to avoid naming the perpetrator today. And I'm going to ask all of you to do the same during our conversation. I don't want to politicize this. And I recognize that my being here does increase the risk of that happening. I'm going to do my part to stay away from partisanship. And I'll ask everybody else here to do the same. I'm not here as a presidential candidate, really. I'm here as a father and as an American. We can't fix the past, but we can prevent tragedies in the future. And the only way to do it is to learn from those mistakes of the past. When an airplane crashes, we recover the black box for a reason. We never want to make that same mistake twice. We have a tradition in this country as law enforcement to do the same thing when there's a mass shooting. It is a long-standing tradition of law enforcement in the United States of America to, when it is recovered, release the manifesto of the shooter. We have to learn from tragedy to prevent it in the future. The manifesto of the killer was made public in each of the following instances. Allen, Texas, Buffalo, New York, Charleston, South Carolina, Isla Vista, California, Monterey Park, California, Poway, California, in all cases, within 48 hours of the tragedy. The public demanded the same happen here in Nashville immediately after the tragedy in March. In fact, the National Police Association has since sued city officials and county officials demanding the same. It turned out that on April 27th, Governor Bill Lee, the governor of this state, pledged to release that manifesto. Yet today we're sitting here in August 
with nothing other than stonewalled silence from our government. That is wrong. That does not build public trust. That erodes public trust. I'm here today to make a demand of the governor of Tennessee, to make a demand of the Nashville Police Department, to make a demand of the FBI. Release the manifesto. Speak the truth. The hard times are the times where we must most openly speak that truth. It is hardest to speak the truth under difficult circumstances, but that is when we require it the most. I understand that there are legitimate concerns, that we do not want details released that will motivate copycats. I don't want that. The fellow Americans who earnestly have called for the release of this manifesto, they don't want that either. And I want to go on record and say it would be perfectly reasonable for the police to redact any sections of this manifesto that lay out specific plans, that lay out specific premeditated plots on details of execution that could be copied by another individual. But what we do need to know is this killer's motives, this killer's psychological state of mind. The truth of the matter is that we have a mental health epidemic in this country that is driving a wave of violence around this country, and we're going to have to deeply understand it if we are to address it. History teaches us that we make our worst policy decisions as a nation when we suppress the truth on the back of a tragedy. Take the tragedy of the COVID-19 pandemic. We would not have shuttered schools in this country if we had been allowed to debate in the open school closures and hear the truth about COVID-19. We would not have mandated COVID vaccines so quickly if we had been allowed to speak the truth about myocarditis risks in young men. We would have held China accountable sooner had we been allowed to say in public and to know that the virus originated in a lab in China. The right answer is to speak the truth and the path to truth runs through transparency from the government. We're now at risk. Thank you. We must speak the truth. It is who we are. Yet we now risk making that same mistake here again, right here in Tennessee. The same governor who pledged to release that manifesto only to renege on that pledge, not to have released it, now hiding it to date, is convening a special session of the legislature of Tennessee later this month on August 21st to call for specific legal anti-gun measures to be passed and signed into law in this state. The right answer may well be to remove psychiatrically ill people from their communities than it is to remove guns from law-abiding citizens. The right answer may well be to put armed security guards in schools, both public schools and private schools, to protect our children and prevent this tragedy. But we're not going to get to the right answer unless we get to the truth. We live in a moment where our government assumes that we cannot handle the truth, that we can't handle the truth about COVID-19, that we can't handle the truth about the COVID vaccines, that we can't handle the truth about Ukraine, that we can't handle the truth about government censorship. Today, that government, same government, assumes that we can't handle the truth about what happened here on March 27th. I am here to say that we the people in the United States of America, we can handle the truth. That is what we fought a revolution to secure in 1776. That is what we must revive to create and restore a government that is truly accountable to its people. I want to close this, thank you, by saying that my hearts go out to the families of the victims who suffered in this tragedy. I cannot imagine what you are going through. I am so grateful to the two officers who took great risk, made the ultimate sacrifice, taking that risk to make sure this tragedy wasn't any worse than it already was. The best we can do to move forward is to discover exactly what happened so that we may hope and we may pray and we may do our part 
to make sure that something like this never happens again. With that, I want to invite to the podium my friend and fellow native in Nashville, Candace Owens, who joins us today. Thank you. Thank you, Candace. I'll keep this brief. I really am here just to support Vivek, and there are very few things that can motivate someone who's six months pregnant uh, to get out of bed and to come down here and to face these cameras. Um, I'm motivated because of family. It's the reason that I moved down here to Nashville two and a half years ago. I was motivated because the values in Tennessee align with the values that I have, and I'm very proud to be a, a native Tennessean today, and I'm very proud to live in Nashville. And so I, I don't want to speak to you as somebody who is a political commentator today. I, I really want to speak to you guys as somebody who is an expecting mother and a mother uh, to two young children, a two-year-old and a one-year-old, about what I think we all felt in this community on that morning. I can't even fathom. It happened really right in my backyard. And I was behind that school just 13 minutes uh, before the shooter was there. And so this really did literally hit home for me. And of course, we have great respect and a great reverence to the police officers that day. We saw acts of heroism that I think are rarely displayed today, especially in the climate of cowardice that exists. It was a climate of cowardice that existed that permitted that individual to execute such a horrific crime against young children, of course. But the answer to that cowardice was extreme heroism. And we need more heroism in this society. I understand being fearful of wanting, not wanting to look evil in the eye. It's a scary thing to look at monsters in the eye. We're scared of that when we're children and we're scared of that when we are adults. It's one of the reasons that I watched that clip of those police officers over and over again, just thinking, my goodness, my goodness what must have been going through their minds and they just executed, they went right in there. You know, that sort of bravery, so rarely do we see it today. We are now being called upon to be brave enough to examine the reasons that motivated somebody to do something so horrific. We cannot fight evil if we won't even look at evil in the face. Again, of course, we understand that as a community, we have all suffered. Of course, I understand the concerns that many may have, that this may motivate somebody else to do the same. But I'm fearful that an individual that's not even be examined, an individual that can do something this horrific, and we don't even explore the reasons, we don't even explore what ideas, what situation, you know, what upbringing perhaps could have led to this moment. I'm fearful that, again, us being too scared to examine what led to that moment will only create the moment again. And so what Vivek said is correct. And I can't imagine that there isn't a, a mother in America right now that does not worry when they drop their children off at school. And there are more answers that we need to have for that, more policy that needs to answer for that, more schools, as Vivek mentioned, that need to have armed security and armed guards. But beyond that, we need to actually have a, a cultural and a familial discussion about what it means to be brave. So I am calling upon everybody who has the power to, to release the manifesto. We, of course, understand that there may be portions that have to be redacted for whatever reason, but redact those portions and allow us to examine it. Because what happened here in my backyard still haunts me today. It still it haunts me as a mother. It haunts me as an American citizen. And I know that I'm not the only person that it haunts. So I'm grateful to you all for being here today. And I hope that we don't forget what happened in Nashville because that what, that's what tends to happen. The media allows time to go by and they say, oh, no, it doesn't matter. This happens to the most vulnerable people in our nation. This happened at an elementary school. We are not going to forget this in Nashville. Open the manifesto. Thank you guys so much for being here today and allowing this to stay in the American conscious. Good afternoon. My name is Aaron Spradlin. I am the uh, chairman of the board of the Faith and Freedom Coalition of the state of Tennessee, the founder of the Mission America Foundation, which is an anti-trafficking organization. But more importantly, I am a owner of a private security consulting firm that works in our schools. Now, the reason that I got asked kindly to come up here and share this podium with such great leaders and brave warriors for the Constitution and for America is to bring my somewhat expertise to the table. We get resolve from tragedy. 
When Columbine happened, it revolutionized the way we secured schools throughout the states, all across the country, because it was such a shock that that could happen the way it happened. It changed the security protocols. It changed how you, how you trained your officers or your private security personnel. That is the importance of what we're talking about today. This manifesto is an education for future events to be prevented. If we knew or finally get to know what the thought process was, what the planning was, who was involved, and everything that makes you stronger, the law enforcement gets their opportunity to prepare to prevent this. And our firm, we believe, to be left of bang. Excuse me? What does that mean? That means you're ahead of the problem before it happens. Okay? This is such an important thing. It needs to be released so that our law enforcement, our agencies, the Tennessee Bureau, they've seen it. But the SROs in the schools and the people that stand there to protect your children need to know what the enemy looks like. They need to know what the enemy's thinking. And they need to be preventive in this ever happening again not only in the city of Nashville, the state of Tennessee, or the entire country, and it can all be based on the release of this document or documents. So with that, I thank you for being here, for listening, and understanding the importance of having this out there. I do challenge, as Vivek said, the governor of Tennessee to release it. We're getting ready to go into a special session to talk about this very thing. The legislators don't even have an opportunity to know what they're going in to talk about, let alone the law enforcement being prepared. So again, I thank you, Candace, Aaron, and letting me have the opportunity to just share a little bit of the common sense that's behind releasing this document. Thank you very much. We'll take questions together. But what I will say for my part. You don't need to hear her mind. What is your point? My point. Yes, sir. My point is that by hearing more of what is in this, you seek to pray, confuse, poor person's mind, take the lives of Christian children. By knowing more, we are only, we are most likely to talk to you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And, sir, what is your name? Andrew, I appreciate I Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I believe in, and I want to say something. I want to say something to everybody here. This is the beauty of this country. We each have the opportunity to express our views in the open. That is the path to truth. We get to truth through hearing multiple views. This is a painful issue. I understand that this is an issue of deep pain in this community and for those parents and those for, for those family members and for that school that I cannot imagine. And I hope that no parent ever has to go through again. But it is my conviction that no matter how ugly the truth, no matter how difficult the truth may be, no matter how much the truth may be even different than what we imagine it to be. We have to see it if we are to heal. 
Many people here, myself included, are people of faith. We believe in a power higher than ourselves, And I do not know of a God who says anything other than that we must actually confront the actual truth. Truth always wins over falsehood. The long arc of history, it bends towards justice, and justice is based on truth. And so I have no preconceived notions about what this will say. It was initially my conviction, and it still remains my feeling, that if this had not been a transgender shooter, if this had been a shooter of any kind, like we've had from Buffalo to Allen to the range of other cities across this country, we would have stuck to the long-standing practice in our country of being transparent within 48 hours. I believe that is the truth. But regardless of what the actual facts are, we the people deserve to at least know them, to reckon with them. And I worry that we will neither heal nor learn from our mistakes until we see that truth and that we the people are a people who created a government that is accountable to us rather than the other way around. And speaking not as a politician, but just as another fellow citizen, we demand to see that truth here in Nashville. We'll take a few more questions. Thank you. It is a fair question that there are members of the community, earnestly, who have asked not to see this released. The sad truth is this is a tragedy for our nation. This is a tragedy beyond Nashville. It's a tragedy in Tennessee. It is a tragedy that we have a mental health epidemic in this country that is spreading like wildfire, and we are hiding from it. We are hiding from the reality of people who are lost, who are hungry for purpose and meaning, perhaps even people who have undergone great suffering that we have not yet reckoned with. And so my concern is that when this legislature convenes less than three weeks from today, they will adopt policies, they will adopt a law, an anti-gun measure in this state that's a form of virtue signaling, that appeases the temporary flares of our tempers, but without actually getting to the root cause of what actually led to this tragedy in the first place. And I think if we should have one objective here, it should be to make sure we have taken every step possible to know that we have at least done our part as Americans to make sure something like this never happens again. And I think those of us who are in policy positions, those of us who are leaders, we should not be able to go to bed at night in peace until we have known that we have done our small part in knowing what we can to prevent tragedy again. And I think that the answer comes down to this. There are two views in this country. There's one view in the United States of America that says we cannot handle the truth. That ugly head, that ugly monster has existed for a long time, singing its siren song. I reject that siren song saying that we the people, no matter how ugly the truth is, we can handle the truth. And in this case, we demand it and I expect on the back of this conversation today, this governor between now and August 21st, when he calls that special session, he happens to be a governor from my same political party. I don't care about partisanship. I expect Governor Lee to step up, to be a leader, to actually have the spine and courage to confront the truth rather than convening a special session based on false premises. And I have every expectation that in the next 18 days, he's going to step up and do it. Thank you. We have, been in, we have been in touch indirectly in a way that wanted to be respectful of the families and the school and their privacy. But my heart goes out to those families and we have to make sure that we respect them at every step of the process, which is why I continue to ask everybody here, even in your questions, please join me in avoiding stating the name of the perpetrator. This is not someone we want to celebrate. We want to prevent this kind of tragedy from happening to other kids and other Americans in the future. So we have, we have a, thank you for that question. What's your name? David. David, thank you for the question. So we have a long-standing tradition in this country, a law enforcement tradition to say that the public needs to understand what the motives of a mass shooter were in order to help prevent that in the future. We have practices. 
to deal with the risk. Is there a risk to exposing the truth? Absolutely there was. Was there a risk potentially to telling the truth about what we knew about risks of vaccines before they're released? Telling the truth about risks of lockdown policies before we implement them? Of course there's risk. The risk is that people may in fear take on behaviors that we don't want them to take on. That's the short run trade-off. But in the long run, this country, unlike other nations like Iran or North Korea or China, this nation is founded on the conviction that the truth wins in the end. And we have the courage to stand up to that truth. So are there ways to practically deal with this? We don't have to reinvent that wheel here in Nashville. It has been done on countless other occasions. I will go on record today to say that I would support any redaction in that memo for any kind of behavior for how to actually execute or carry out a killing or secure weapons or to go about actually being the perpetrator of a crime, you are correct. There's no public benefit in knowing those specific details that a copycat could mimic. But to understand the state of mind of a mentally deranged individual who suffers from a mental health condition evidenced by gender dysphoria and sadly, even further at a scale that left six people dead. We have to understand that because that's not just this perpetrator. That is a mental health epidemic that is resulting in violence and death across this country. And I think we cannot stand by as bystanders to watch that happen. I support the transparency in getting to the truth so that we know what that response really is. In my view, now, now I am speaking in my capacity. Today I'm here in my capacity as an American and as a father and as a concerned citizen. But since your question goes to policy, in my capacity as a presidential candidate, I'm going to speak a hard truth. Something that we're not supposed to talk about, but I think is the hard facts of where we are as a country today. The decline in mental health institutions, in psychiatric institutions in this country, correlates directly inversely with the rise of violent crime in this country. We have to confront that. And while the consensus behavior may be to say, we're gonna remove guns from law-abiding citizens and feel better about ourselves, that might make some people feel better about themselves in the short run. But in the long run, the right answer, I believe, is going to have to involve some measure of removing severely psychiatrically ill people who pose physical risks to those around them to remove them from their community, as we have for many times in this nation's past and during which we had much lower instances of crime and mass crime that we do have today. That's my perspective as a policymaker, but today I'm not here to give a policy speech. I'm here as a concerned citizen to make one demand, which I fully expect will be fulfilled by a governor to see through a promise that he made to the citizens of his state that he would release that manifesto and before he signs any bill into law in response to it, he has a moral and personal obligation to let that truth be known. Thank you. Sure. So after we close the first portion of this discussion, I will address questions relating to a lawsuit that I have filed against the U.S. Department of Justice relating to the politicized persecution through prosecution of a former president and their failure to publicly release information that deserves to be made transparent. I don't want to commingle the topics, and so at the end of the first wave of questions, I'll come back to that topic. As it relates to school shootings and securing our students, here's what I'll say. The $80 billion budget spent by our U.S. Department of Education is over four times the cost required to put three armed security guards in every school in this country. I think it's not even close, which is a better use of funds. I applaud those two officers who did not know that their name would be called that day as they went in and put themselves in harm's way. I watched it at the time, I watched it again today before I came here, the videos of those two officers, the body footage. It's hard to, to watch that without your heart feeling for those two officers who took the risks they did that day. But we would have had there and, and had that problem addressed even sooner if three armed security guards were indeed present in that school. And instead, here we are paying it 
to a government bureaucracy sitting in Washington, D.C., with thousands upon thousands of bureaucrats disbursing tens of billions of dollars that are actually impeding educational outcomes in this country rather than advancing them. So, yes, I stand on the side of taking a small portion of that U.S. Department of Education budget and directing it in a way that actually protects our children because another school shooting like this is unconscionable. And not one, but I do think three armed security guards per school will meaningfully take a step to preventing this from ever happening again. I would take another question. We'll come back to you. Thank you for the question. So this is a thoughtful question. You are correct that I have pledged as U.S. president to shut down the FBI. I believe it is a politicized institution. I believe that it has set back law enforcement in this country. The same FBI that threatened Martin Luther King Jr. with suicide 60 years ago is the same FBI that threatens political opponents of a different persuasion today. The same FBI that is hiding and sitting on this manifesto that it could have released to the public, the same FBI that in other instances has released the manifestos of mass shooters in this country. And so to the question of who would investigate it, there are 35,000 officers, there are 35,000 employees in the FBI. 15,000 are frontline agents who would do better work in an agency that was not yet politicized, like the U.S. Marshals, who would carry out this particular investigation, or the Drug Enforcement Agency, or the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network at the U.S. Treasury. That is how we drive change, and the remaining 20,000 will have to go home and find honest work in the private sector rather than inflicting their policy preferences in the guise of law enforcement. Thank you for that question. We'll take three more questions before moving to the second portion of the press conference. You raise an outstanding question, which is that there has been, I believe, painstakingly collected data over a long period of time by law enforcement. And by the way, most of the people who work in the FBI are individually, as human beings, individually good people. That is precisely why it is a travesty when this institution goes out of its way to hide the truth from the public. It is a regular practice of law enforcement in this country to release the manifesto of a shooter. In every major mass shooting that has been the precedent, there is good reason for this precedent. It is the same reason we recover the black box of an airplane that goes down. And yet in this instance, when it was a transgender individual who committed that shooting, in this particular instance, they have chosen without explanation not to release it and even to renege against a prior commitment to release it. That does not build trust not only in that agency, but even in the very data sets that you describe. So do I believe that we should disregard the data that these institutions have collected? No. I want us to use every tool in our arsenal to make sure that something like this never happens again. But in order to build that trust, we have a government that must earn that trust from its citizens. It's not that complicated. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. The whole truth, nothing but the truth. We can handle the truth. And that's the way we do things in this country. I'll take two more questions from folks who haven't asked. I do believe they're hiding this manifesto. The most important thing in this case, as it relates to the local handling of this matter, 
should be to make sure that we respect the dignity and the experience of what those parents are going through. We also have to celebrate the heroes and the police officers in this community. That much has to be sacrosanct. But as policymakers at the state level and at the federal level, if we're going to pass new laws that bind the way citizens and residents of Tennessee live their lives, then I think it is a precondition for any governor who is convening a special session of the legislature to pass binding laws in response to this tragedy, to do everything in his power to cause the release of that manifesto. And any number of groups could do it. What's that? I believe that the governor and or other leaders will step up and do their part. And I want to hand it over to Candace. To say, I don't, you know, let's not pit the parents of Nashville against each other. I expressed to you as a mother what it's like having that happen in your backyard with young children that are going to be attending elementary school next year, right? So the concern, there's no priority. You know, all parents are concerned. We grieved with those parents. We pray for those children. We all have signs as a community in our yard for those children. You know, so I, I just want to be really clear that the question is whether or not we should be pitting which parent gets more priority. We absolutely have to have answers. That every parent who is dropping their child off today, every parent as I'm looking at Christian schools to enroll my son into right now, the first question that I'm asking is about security. But I need, I need answers, right? We can't be fearful to look evil. So of course we are compassionate. Of course we have given every bit of deferential treatment to those individuals that actually suffered that tragedy and had to bury their young ones. We all cried with them. So I just wanted to say that because I felt that that was saying, do you think you're more important than them? And, and no, we are a community here in Nashville. No one is no more important, but tons of parents in Nashville and in the Nashville area have lost sleep thinking about these children and thinking about our own children. So we need a community answer, a community solve, not questions that pit us against one another. Uh, gentlemen, you had a question right there. I talked about this on my show. It's the one thing that we never talk about is big pharma. We never talk about what's in these people's medicine cabinets. We never talk about the fact that we are over-diagnosing children with anxiety, with depression, with ADHD, and we are giving them pharmaceuticals that are impacting their brain structure. Um, and so, yes, uh, I'm speaking in my own personal capacity here, and what I have said on my show, and what I will say over and over again, we are always pointing the finger at somebody. We're pointing the finger at a parent. We're pointing, pointing a finger at a religion. We're pointing a finger at a person, an ideology. And we never have a discussion about mental health. And we never have a discussion about what I don't believe to be a long-term fix to mental health issues, which is over-prescribing uh, young minds and expecting their brains to function the same when they're heavily medicated. So I do think that that is one component that I would love to open up discussion for just as a community and, you know, as all sorts of medicines now that are being given to children. We'll take one last question on this portion uh, before we wrap up. If there's anybody who has not yet asked a question, we will take one. Thank you. The legislators may be able to access it, but what we really need is to rebuild public trust in our institutions. And I think that the reality is a small group of government leaders being able to access a piece of information behind closed doors that in truth belongs to the public at large, that embodies everything that's wrong with our current moment in this country. We fought a revolution in 1776 to say that we, the people, cause our government to come into existence to be accountable to us rather than the other way around. In the old world, on the other side of an Atlantic 250 years ago, they did it a different way. They said that a small group of elites behind closed doors in the back of palace halls got to know the truth and then do what was right for the rest of society at large. In 1776, we say we don't do it that way here in America. We do it through free speech and open debate in the public square where every person's voice counts equally, where the government speaks truth to its people. And I have full confidence that though in the short run it may come with great difficulty and cost, 
in the long run, we will be better off for it to rebuild trust grounded in the truth itself. With that, I want to end the first portion of this discussion thanking the people of this community who have been participating in this conversation, regardless of whether they agree or disagree with me and the other community members here. I want to thank Faith and Freedom, both Aaron's, for joining us. My friend and a mother in Nashville, Candace Owens, for joining us. And thank you for your courage in coming out today. Thank you. At this time, I'll just take two last questions, as promised to the press, on the matter relating to last night's announcement. Last night's announcement. Sure. So now I'm speaking in my capacity as a presidential candidate here. I am running for U.S. president in the same race that Donald Trump is running, and I would have made very different decisions than he would have made. But a bad judgment is not the same thing as a crime, and I think it sets a dangerous precedent in this country for the party in power to use police force to arrest its political opponents during an ongoing presidential election on the basis of untested legal theories. And so I stick to the same principle. I just want to know the truth from the government. What did Joe Biden tell Merrick Garland? What did Merrick Garland ch tell Jack Smith? We deserve to know. A little over a month ago, I filed a Freedom of Information Act request under the law, giving a specific time horizon and timetable to the U.S. government to turn over records to the public. Whatever the facts are, I think we, the public, deserve to know. They did not abide by that timeline. That then gives me, as a citizen, standing to sue in federal court. And yesterday, that's exactly what I did while also earlier today filing a new FOIA request relating to the most recent indictment to know the same. We're told we have a special prosecutor. Great. The government should be transparent about all communications between the White House and Merrick Garland and between either of them, Merrick Garland or Joe Biden and Jack Smith. And I think the public will be better off for, yes, knowing the truth. And whatever the truth is, yes, we can handle the truth. I'll take Two last questions on this, and then we'll wrap it up. I think that what happened in the year leading up to January 6th is actually very relevant to even the first half of the conversation that we had here about the manifesto. We had a year of Americans being told to stay locked down in their basement. Shut up, sit down, do as you're told. If you question it, your social media accounts are censored. If you question it, where the virus came from, from a lab in Wuhan, you're called a racist. Your internet account and access is locked up. You try to send a story that we now know to be true on the eve of an election. Your social media accounts are shut down. Media couldn't report it. The New York Post had its account locked. You repeatedly tell people in this country they cannot speak. That is when they scream. You repeatedly lie to people and then tell them they cannot scream. That's when they tear things down. So I do not want to see another day in our lives when we see something like what happened on January 6th. But my concern is that if we fail to learn the lesson of true censorship, the true suppression of information, the true suppression of truth and what that does to a free people in this nation, I fear that we are destined for far worse than that in the future unless we actually do something about it. And I think transparency, openness, free speech and open debate are the only way forward. And when there's kerosene on the ground, it almost doesn't matter who lights the match. We got to ask who poured the kerosene on the ground in the first place. And that's what I think we need to clean up.
So what's your name? Hall. Thank you, Hall. So I'll, I'll close on this. I'm not in this race to run against anybody. I'm really not. I'm not running against Donald Trump. I'm not running against Joe Biden. I'm running for this nation. Whoever occupies the White House next, I want it to be someone who, yes, I can look my two sons in the eye and tell them in good conscience without wincing, without holding my nose and looking the other way. Kids know when you're lying to them. Kids know when you're telling the truth. I want to tell them the truth when I say, I want you to grow up and be like him. I'm not perfect. Nobody is. But that is the standard I want you to hold me to if you put me in that office. I truly believe it that we don't have to be a nation in decline. We're taught to believe that we are. Even in spite of the tragedy that afflicted this community earlier this year. It's a very difficult thing for me to say, but I believe it to be true. I think that we as a nation are really still in our ascent, actually. Maybe even in the early stages of our ascent. Maybe we're all just a little young, going through our own version of adolescence, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up. And so for me, everything that I think what I'm going to do is I, I don't care about litigating and pointing the finger of who's done what wrong. I care about how we're going to have one nation left at the end of it. And I think that's a nation founded on the truth. I will do my part and speak the truth at every step. And I think that, is that your son with you? Your grandson. What's your name, young man? Hall. Hall Jr. <laughs> well, Hall Jr., how old, how old are you? Six? Well, you're three years older than my son, but you're in the same generation. So we can look Hall and my son Karthik and Arjun, both of them in the eye, and tell them that we're still that nation where no matter who you are or where you came from or what your skin color is, you get ahead by working hard, being dedicated, and speaking the truth and expecting the same from your government. And if we can give them that, that will be a win for our country. Thank you all. Last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Thank you. I'm in this to lead this nation to a national revival. I don't do well in a number two position. I believe that there are many ways to change this country. And so I want... So I'm not a Christian. I am a Hindu, but I, we share those Christian values. Thank you for the question. And thank you for the question. And I, I believe we'll answer questions honestly at every step of the way. I want to thank every member of this community. My pledge to you is that we will answer Every question in this campaign, agree or disagree, whoever you are, wherever you come from, you are a fellow citizen. And even if we disagree, I will always take your question and give you the dignity of a response as long as you give the same courtesy in return. That is who we are as Americans. I will tell you who I am and what I stand for. If that's what the people of this country want, then I'll proudly serve as your next president. Thank you all. God bless you. And God bless our United States. Thank you. Thank you. Ha, ha, ha.